This course is on diversity and inclusion uh, for law firms, and it's aimed at an audience of attorneys. Uh, this is something that our team, led by Christy Levy, uh, designed and developed uh, for a client called the Practicing Law Institute, or PLI. PLI is the largest continuing legal education provider uh, in the field, and their clients are uh, pretty much all major law firms, uh, and also a lot of smaller firms and individual practitioners. So there's kind of a, a large audience of attorneys, uh, most of whom are uh, at big law firms, and that's the audience for this course. The course has already rolled out um, in May of 2022. It's been out for about a month and has had about 750 people used it already, which is a lot by uh, by PLI standards, and it's been very well received. So, um, It's a course that was designed with the help of a number of subject matter experts who Christy spent time interviewing, um, and one of them is a woman named Michelle Silverthorne, who appears on camera. So we're going to go ahead and show some selected parts of this program. And first, let's take a look at an intro to the course from Michelle Silverthorne, a DEI expert, as uh, she also has a legal background. And so we'll watch Michelle and see what she has to say to set the course up. Welcome to our program on diversity and inclusion in legal settings. I'm Michelle Silverthorne, and I'm here to introduce and wrap up this program. I'm a lawyer, a diversity speaker, a culture change expert, and the founder of Inclusion Nation, a diversity solutions company. In this program, you'll be asked to consult on a fictional television show about a law firm. You'll make decisions about the cast and characters and give feedback on how scenes play out. This is such an innovative approach, and I absolutely encourage you to enjoy the experience. But just because it's fun, and we hope it is, doesn't mean that it isn't important. The topics we cover here, diversity and inclusion, are tremendously important. Entire careers can be made or broken by the biases people face, and whether or not others stand up to those biases and put systems in place to create more inclusive workplaces. And it isn't just careers that are made or broken. Younger lawyers and clients are insisting on it. There's a high demand for top talent these days, and firms and other organizations need to be diverse and inclusive if they want to attract, develop, and keep great lawyers in order to survive and thrive. If you want your practice and our legal profession to continue to evolve and serve justice, and if you want to establish a legacy as an attorney and as a leader, you need to create a space where bias is interrupted, where equality and equity matter, and where inclusion is championed. So I encourage you to make the most of this program and go forward and make changes in your work and at your workplace. To that end, I'd like you to keep two things in mind throughout this program. The first is the concept of empathy, and the second is how to set goals to make a change within your sphere of influence. Let's talk about empathy first. Throughout this program, you'll meet a variety of characters, including quite a few attorneys from traditionally marginalized groups. These are actors playing roles, but the experiences they show are very real. Some you may have experienced, others you may not have. In some cases, you'll get to hear their perspective and hear how they are feeling about what happens to them. You'll want to really listen to their words and think about how they must feel. In other cases, you won't hear from the characters directly. You may not even meet them and will just hear them referred to at meetings or in conversation. But I still want you to put yourself in their shoes. Think about their experiences. If you've experienced these situations, how did those around you react? How did you? And if you haven't experienced them, how would you feel if these things happened to you? And not just for the brief moments you'll see in this program, but time and time again, every day. Next, I want to say a few words about setting goals to bring about change within your sphere of influence. I hope you learn a lot in this program. You'll see how to identify bias and how to interrupt it when it's directed at you, how to intervene when you see it directed at others, but that isn't enough. Our entire legal profession needs to change and rewrite the rules to interrupt bias for good. So throughout this program, think about how you can apply what you learn, not just to change your own behavior, but also to influence the people and systems in your circle. 
I am so excited to kick off this program. There is a lot of research and data behind it. The content comes from experts in the field, and the approach is based on research done on the effectiveness of diversity training. I hope you learn a lot and think about how you can apply what you learn. I'll be back at the end of the program. The course has a large number of different types of activities and different video scenes. And it's built around a construct that you, as the user of the course, are uh, helping out with a legal drama, a, a fictitious television show. And the reason for this little construct was so that we had kind of an easy way for there to be scenes that then the user would be asked to comment on and rewrite so that we could kind of see scenes playing out um, in the original form where, where maybe it isn't a diverse enough team and there's some other you know instances of bias and often in a better form where the uh, user gets the chance to recast or reach or change the uh, change the composition of the team and then see the same situation play out differently and so that's kind of the reason for this idea of a, of a TV show uh, running behind the scenes but mo mostly you you kind of just get into the scenes and don't think about it too much on a moment to moment basis couple other characters, though, that I uh, wanted to mention. So we saw Michelle, who is a subject matter expert, who appears at the beginning and the end of the course. There's also Tom and Nikita, who are expert consultants who sort of synthesize the, the other uh, eight or nine subject matter experts who Christy interviewed. Um, and they are there to provide advice and uh, content, really, as, as things go on and, and talk about what went on in each scene and um, provide a lot of other information that can help the uh, learners make good decisions. And then there's also a character named Kayla, who is sort of the producer of the show, who pops in once in a while, and, and she's really not uh, as much content as just kind of moving things along. So those are some people that you'll see as this progresses. So, so as the first uh, actor scene we're going to show, uh, you'll see a situation in which there are a handful of uh, problems going on at the law firm. As you'll see, things are not going ideally. And then you'll see the team tasked with addressing those issues in their meeting. And then Tom and Nikita will uh, come in with some uh, relevant content. And in the end, after making a couple of, of decisions, the learner will get to see the uh, same scene and how things might go uh, better with a different team. So that's a uh, little bit of setup, and you'll see what uh, happens now in these next actor scenes. I've thought about this for a while, and I've decided that it's time for me to move on and leave the firm. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, Casey. Uh, you're a valuable member of the team, and I, for one, hate to lose you. Can I ask why you're leaving, and uh, is, there, is there anything we can do to change your mind? Thank you, but I've made my decision. I just don't think the firm is a good fit for me. Well, uh... I wish you best of luck in the future, then. Thank you. I do have something I need to tell you. I've received an offer from another firm, which I plan to accept, so I'll be leaving. And Rahul and Sura will be coming with me. Now, I know this makes things complicated because the three of us are working together on the Baker matter, which is why we wanted to let you know as soon as we could. Uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, this is going to cause a lot of problems with the Baker work losing all three of you at once. Is there a problem with the client, with the team? No, no problems. We just received a great opportunity somewhere else. I hate to lose all of you. How about I talk to Arthur about getting you all more money? Oh, thanks, but it's really not about the money. It's just time for us to move on to another opportunity. We all really do want to thank you for everything during our time here. Did you guys hear that Lorea, Rahul, and Sura are all leaving? 
all of them at once? That's the core team of associates on the Baker matter. I know. It's going to be an adventure. And Casey gave notice early this week. I mean, this place is becoming a ghost town. Maybe I should start looking while our firm still has a good name. I'm not shocked about Casey. I heard he was unhappy and was looking. I'm not surprised about Lorea, Rahul, and Sura either. And from what I'm hearing, these aren't the last of these departures. It's gonna get a little crazy. Speaking of crazy, did you guys see the line at the oh new vegetarian God, yeah. takeout spot, the one across the street? Yes, yes. yes. I walked yes. past there yesterday and the line was all the way around the block. My friend went and said it was great, but I think I'll wait until the line calms down a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, we seem to be having a bit of an HR issue these days. I know. Uh, Casey gave notice earlier this week. Right. And three of my associates gave notice as well. Lorea, Rahul, and Sura. These are good associates. We hate to lose them. And things could be getting worse. I overheard a group of associates talking yesterday. They heard rumors that more people may be leaving. We really can't afford to take the hit of losing a lot of associates in a short time. You know, people will talk. These departures aren't going to make us look good. What's going on? Are the associates' salaries in line with what they can get at other firms? Definitely. Actually, our associates' salaries are on the higher end. Okay. Well, still, how much more will it cost to keep the associates happy? I really don't think that the issue is money. All right. I even suggested to my departing associates that I could try and get them a raise but they said they weren't interested. Oh, we all know it's just about money. People just pretend it isn't. Maybe we can boost their salaries by 5% or give them a year-end bonus increase. Or maybe periodic bonuses at different times throughout the year. Uh, maybe a bonus if a client is really happy with an associate so we can tie the bonuses to performance. You know, I like that idea. I wish we did that back when I was an associate. The producers want the last scene with the partners to show a successful team. So, what do you think? Do you think the team is likely to reach a solution that solves the problem and improves associate retention? Maybe they will, but I don't think so. I think this team is unlikely to come up with a creative solution to this problem, and I think that the primary reason for this is its lack of diversity and inclusion. A diverse and inclusive environment where everyone has a fair chance to do their best is ethically and morally the right thing to do. But if that isn't motivating enough, do it because it will have a positive effect on your bottom line. Diversity helps you attract clients and understand customer needs. Plus, many corporate clients have a mandate to hire diverse firms. And not just firms that have a single woman or attorney of color as someone they show off in the initial presentations, but firms that truly have a richly diverse team that's actively engaged in meaningful work. A diverse workforce will also provide your firm with a bigger network of potential clients. Clients often choose firms whose attorneys include people that they can relate to. The more diverse your team, the more likely it is that someone will click with a potential client. And having a diverse team helps you attract and keep talent. When people feel accepted and valued, they are happier and more likely to stay. Such an inclusive environment helps attract more top talent and the cycle continues. Diversity lowers risk, not just the risk of discrimination charges against the firm, but the risk of making mistakes. Diverse teams raise more facts and challenge more errors. And diverse teams are more innovative and productive. Here's something that's particularly relevant to the HR meeting scene that you just saw. Diverse teams come up with better strategies and more creative solutions. They have a wider range of ideas and they have different experiences and perspectives to shape these ideas into better solutions. This leads to more successful outcomes and higher client satisfaction. Additionally, homogeneous teams have blind spots. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, they don't know what they don't know. Diverse teams are better able to spot a wider range of issues, allowing them to anticipate and then plan for solutions to these issues. In this way, diverse teams are key to risk management. The real benefit of diversity, in addition to it being the just thing to do, is in the talent and the better outcomes. 
It's important to note that research shows that in order to gain the true benefits of diversity, it needs to start at the top. It isn't enough to have a diverse group of associates. Your management needs to not only support diversity and inclusion, but the management itself needs to be diverse. Also, don't limit your concept of diversity. Diversity includes race, age, culture, location, social mobility, disability, educational background, professional experience, language, gender identity, orientation, marital and familial status, beliefs, military experience, and even hobbies. And remember, you need more than just a diverse team. You need an inclusive environment in order to reap the advantages of diversity. Let's think back to the scene with the partners that we just saw. There was very little diversity, only one woman and no people of color. And the one time the female partner spoke up against Arthur, the senior partner, challenging that money might not be the issue, she was immediately shot down. And Arthur definitely set the tone for the meeting. He made the final decisions and decided when to move on. Many times, even when a group looks diverse, there's pressure to stay in line with what the group leader thinks. That's an example of diversity without inclusion. And it just doesn't bring the benefits of a diverse group. Our writers and producers thought about the points that the expert consultants just made and decided to rewrite the scene and change the characters, replacing a lot of the cast. Let's see what they came up with. So, uh, there seems to be a bit of an issue with HR these days. Yes, I know. Casey gave notice earlier this week, and three of my associates gave notice as well. Lorea, Rahul, and Sura. These are all good associates. We hate losing them. And things could get worse. There's been a lot of buzz within the associates that more people are thinking of leaving. We really can't afford to take a hit on losing a lot of associates in a short time. You know, people talk. All these departures aren't going to make us look good. What's going on? Are the associates' salaries in line with what they could get at other firms? Our associates' salaries are fine. More than fine, really. They're on the higher end compared to other firms around here. Okay. Well, still, how much more do you think it will cost to make the associates happy? I don't think that the issue is money. I even suggested to my departing associates that I could try and get them a raise. But they said they weren't interested. Oh, I don't know. Isn't it always about the money? Oh, I think it's about something more. All right. Two of my associates who are leaving, Lorea and Raul, they have young kids, so I think they're just looking for more work schedule flexibility. I have a friend who works at Cooper & Perry, and she says they have very flexible working schedule, and they allow associates to work from home whenever possible and have no plans on changing that. I'd actually love that kind of flexibility myself. I'd be around my kids more and I know I'd get my work done. Flexibility sounds like a good idea to me too, but I think maybe in Casey's case, at least, that's not the issue. He's been working on the Doe Light matter, and uh, their VP doesn't like Casey's interpreter joining us. The VP says it slows down the meetings. So Casey gets left behind to do the back-end work, which, I mean, come on, is so disrespectful, but Casey's bigger complaint is that he hasn't really gotten to build relationships with the client and build those client-facing skills. Wow, I, I think this is really wrong. And I think it brings up a bigger issue too. A lot of our high-profile partners handpick their team. So that means that they always pick the same type of people then those people, they get a leg up for the next assignment. More and more face time, better and better assignments, on and on. Then they're in a better position to make partner, too. Huh. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. I can see how that could happen. Yes, this is definitely an issue. And it's hard for people when they look up to senior leadership and they don't see someone who looks like them. Hmm. So it's tempting to find a place where more people look like you. And it seems, at least, that there's more opportunity for everyone. Maybe our associates don't feel valued here. And I can see how Casey may have felt that he wasn't given the same opportunities as everyone else. And Ricardo, to your point, I can see how Lorea, Raul, and Sura look around and they don't see leaders who look like them. 
we are losing a lot of good people. But this is why it's a major concern. I agree. I think we need to seriously look into this before we start losing more people. Maybe we need to start a task force on diversity and inclusion and do it now. Yes, we definitely need to do this and I'd love to be a part of it. You know, I would as well. Uh, I agree that this can't wait. Okay, everyone seems agreed. Let's start a diversity and inclusion task force and not just something that gives lip service to the issue. I'll make sure that it has the power to make real changes. Plus, you guys are right. Uh, this can't just be an issue that a handful of partners look into. We have to make sure that this issue includes people from all levels of the organization. Mandy, Ricardo, you two want to be leads on this? But definitely keep me in the loop. I want to make sure that firm management is solidly supporting your efforts. The team we saw in the second rewritten and recast version of the meeting was able to come up with better solutions that took into account key factors that were not raised in the initial version of the scene. And this was precisely because the recast team was diverse. You saw how different perspectives led to different and certainly better ideas. And diversity is about far more than race and gender. Age and parental status also played a role in the discussion that led to the improved plan we saw in the second version of the meeting. More diverse teams bring more to the table. You can't predict how someone's background and experiences will contribute, but they will nearly always make a difference. And it isn't enough to simply have a diverse team. You can't just use a checklist to select people and then sit back and wait for them to produce or include them only in specific meetings to try to attract a certain client. It's critical to go beyond just assembling a diverse team and create an environment, an inclusive environment, in which everyone sincerely feels welcomed, valued, and productively engaged. That's the difference between diversity and inclusion. We saw this in the second meeting scene. This time, the firm did bring a diverse group to the table, but that wouldn't have been enough on its own. Think about what we saw. Arthur, the senior partner, really listened. No one was cut off or ignored. He didn't have to agree with every opinion, but he was respectful, and that created an environment where people from all backgrounds and at all levels of experience felt comfortable providing input. They felt listened to. They brought different perspectives to the conversation without worrying about being treated like an outsider. And ultimately, that open environment allowed the second group to come up with a much better plan than the first team. Sorry, can I pull you away? We've got another crisis on the set. Next, we'll get to see an activity where you, as the learner, um, are looking for instances of bias in a video scene. And when you see one, you note it immediately. And so you click the flag bias button, you make your note, and then the scene will move on. And then after the scene is over, you'll get to see what you had, which is all saved in our database, um, popped up like an old VH1 pop-up video, also with expert comments popped up. So you'll be able to see where you agreed and disagreed with the experts. So this is a very open-ended but interesting and fun activity. It really makes you think a lot and, and observe a lot. And uh, you'll see uh, an example of a couple of biases that um, I, as a uh, potential learner, uh, flagged. And then you'll get to see some analysis of everything and the expert comments as well. Thanks, everyone, for being part. OK, so I'm going to just interrupt right here. I see bias already. Look at this room, and it's really all men, almost all older men, running this meeting. So there's clearly, this is just not a diverse group. So I want to make a comment about that. Part of the hiring committee. We've received a lot of resumes, and we need to go through them and decide who we want to invite to come in for an interview. The idea of having our top associates reach out to their alma maters to recruit more applicants, 
for those schools is working out well. <laughs> we know those schools produce great lawyers, so why not get more just like them? <laughs> Let's go through the applicants one by one. Does everyone have the resumes we sent out? Uh, Jill, could you take notes on our decisions as we go? Uh, okay, so I definitely see bias here. Jill isn't the note taker. Jill is a partner. Why would she be taking notes? Just, I guess, because she's the only woman in the room. So I'm going to flag that as an instance of bias as well. Sure. Okay. Let's get started. Um, okay, the first candidate is Kwame Onanagu. That's a tough one. If this, if we hire this guy, we'll just need to call him KO. <laughs> <laughs> Here's definitely something offensive and an instance of bias where Arthur's ridiculing and mocking uh, a candidate's name, and it's just everybody's kind of going along with it as well. So I'm going to make a note of that one. Um, he has excellent grades and lots of activities. Yeah, but I've never even heard of his law school. Come on, Hal. We all know that the only schools you've ever admitted having heard of are the Ivy League schools. Okay, that may be true, but look. Right there, he's got two periods after summer associate. You don't see that kind of mistake from someone from a real law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty sloppy. Not a lot of attention being paid to detail. Yeah, it doesn't Okay, I'm going to stop this clip here for now. I've caught some instances of bias. I'm sure I missed a few. And uh, what I'm going to do next is we're going to move ahead and Michaela, our host, is going to push us forward and then the experts are going to show us what they thought. So we'll see the expert uh, comments as pop-ups alongside our own comments and then we'll also get a debrief from the experts on their view of the entire clip. Thanks so much for doing that. I've asked our experts to take a pass at it as well. Take a look at what they said compared to what you said. Then you can meet up with them again to hear more about what they saw. Thanks everyone for being part of the hiring committee. We've received a lot of resumes and we need to go through them and decide who we want to invite to come in for an interview. The idea of having our top associates reach out to their alma maters to recruit more applicants for those schools is working out well. <laughs> we know those schools produce great lawyers, so why not get more just like them? <laughs> Let's go through the applicants one by one. Does everyone have the resumes we sent out? Uh, Jill, could you take notes on our decisions as we go? Uh, sure. Okay. Let's get started. Um, okay, the first candidate is Kwame Onanagu. That's a tough one. If this, if we hire this guy, we'll just need to call him KO. <laughs> um, he has excellent grades and lots of activities. Yeah, but I've never even heard of his law school. Come on, Hal. We all know that the only schools you've ever admitted having heard of are the Ivy League schools. Okay, that may be true, but look, right there, he's got two periods after summer associate. You don't see that kind of mistake from someone from a real law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty sloppy. Not a lot of attention being paid to detail. Yeah, it doesn't seem like he'd fit here to me. No. Okay, noted. All right, decision made, then we'll pass. On to number two, Diana Samuels. Oh, now see, you'll like her, so will I. She went to your law school. Uh, now that's what I'm looking for. She's a sure hire then. She does have a typo in her resume. Uh, both the S and the U in summer, in summer associate are capitalized. I mean, you know, what's with everybody sending us resumes with typos? That's surprising, but not a big deal. We know she can write. Look at what law school she went to. Her grades and activities are solid. Yeah, she seems good to me. I agree. Okay, decision made. Let's bring her in for an interview. Jill, why don't you interview her? You'd be a great mentor for her. Uh, sure. I'd be happy to. Okay, moving on. Next up, 
Mark Thomas. Another good school. And we've made a lot of good hires from that school before. We have. John Meyer went here. Amy Miller, a few others. And look at this guy's clerkship. I'm impressed. Yeah, but I see he, uh, he plays in a wheelchair basketball league. I mean, it, it's, he has that under activities. I mean, we can't just not interview him because he has a disability. You're right. Legally, we can't do that, so we'll interview him. But I do worry about his ability to keep up in our fast-paced environment. Why don't we have that associate interview him? You know, the guy with the cane. He can help explain what it will take to keep up around here. You mean Jim? Right. Jim from our corporate practice. He keeps up okay. I think he'd be the right interviewer for this guy. Okay, sounds like a good plan. We can't take any chances. We need someone that can work at our pace. I like the rest of his resume, but we've got a lot going on here, and we are not for everybody. Okay. Decision made. We'll go ahead with the interview. Jill, can you note that? Got it. Okay. Uh, then let's move on to our next candidate, uh, Sean Fitzgerald. Oh, Sean Fitzgerald, the guy who clerked for Brown, Judge Brown? Yeah, that's him. You know him? Not well. Um, I met him at a fundraising dinner a couple of months ago, uh, and we talked for a while. Nice guy. Uh, looked very well put together, very polished. I was very impressed. His resume seems fine to me, and Ed liked him, so let's bring him in. Everyone okay with that? Okay. <laughs> All right, next up for review is Alexis Lopez. She has great grades. She even has publication. Yeah, but her publication is about legal services clients. Uh, uh, maybe she'd be a better fit in a legal aid group. I mean, you know, would she work well with our high-end clients? Uh, you know, is she polished enough? She's from a decent school, though, right, Hal? Well, yeah, it's a decent school, if not top tier for me, but isn't this where Steve Halliburton went? Remember that guy? The associate we hired for the media law practice that washed out in, what, a month? I remember him, yeah. He just couldn't hack it here. No. Okay, let's say no to her and move on. Everyone agreed? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> this last one looks great. Jack Lewis, great school, excellent grades, good clerkship. We'll invite him back for sure. <laughs> yeah? Okay, then, that does it. I think we're done here. What did you think? Did you spot the same bias as we did? Did you catch anything we missed? Let's take a closer look at some of the things we saw. First, while there was some diversity at the table, there didn't seem to be a lot of inclusivity. Asking Jill, the only woman there, to take notes makes her seem more like a secretary than the partner than she is. Arthur, the senior partner, really dominated the conversation and didn't seem to value the opinions of others, except for maybe, sometimes, the other older white men, Hal and Ed. And Amir, the only attorney of color, barely spoke a word. I wonder if that's because he doesn't feel like his opinion is valued. There may be some history there, or it may be a sign of the culture. The rest of the team should have noticed this and really encouraged him to weigh in. Arthur seemed excited about going back to the same schools where successful associates have come from. And this does make sense. If something works, it's natural to want to do it again. But doing this is likely to result in more associates similar to the current ones. That certainly isn't a good way to diversify a team. When Arthur mangled, then mocked, the name of the first candidate, Kwame Okongwu, he really sent the message that this isn't someone to be respected. My guess is this was because the name sounded like it belonged to a black man. That seemed to set the team on the track to find something wrong with him. Even though he had excellent grades and activities, they rejected him for a small typo. Yes, attention to detail is critical, and that could be a valid reason to reject a candidate but the team ignored a typo in the very next applicant. This is confirmation bias. You pay attention to evidence that goes along with or confirms what you already believe, and you ignore or downplay evidence that goes against your beliefs. They had a negative impression from the start about the first applicant, Kwame, based on his name, so they saw the typo as confirmation that he wasn't a good candidate. They had a positive impression about the second candidate, Diana, because of where she went to school, so they downplayed her typo because it didn't fit into their preconceived ideas about her. There's a famous experiment that was conducted by the Nexion's research and consulting firm's president and lead researcher, Dr. Aaron Reeves. In the study, lawyers were asked to evaluate a memo purportedly as part of a writing analysis study. 
Some of the evaluators were told the writer was white. Others were told the writer was black. The memo was identical, but the reviewers who thought the writer was black found more errors and gave an overall lower rating to the memo, the same memo, than the reviewers gave when they thought the writer was white. I can't help but wonder if that's what was going on with the hiring committee's discussion of Kwame. They seemed biased against him from the initial mention of his name, sought evidence to support that bias, and ignored the evidence, his excellent grades and activities, that would go against their biases. The second candidate, Diana, certainly got the benefit of the doubt without any of the scrutiny that the previous candidate received. The bias is clearly in her favor, since she comes from the same school as Arthur, the senior partner. The team glossed over her decent grades and activities and quickly decided to invite her in for an interview. I'm not sure about the decision to have Jill, the lone female at the table, be the one to interview Diana. On one hand, Jill is obviously important enough to be at the table, but on the other, it isn't clear how much she is respected. Arthur had her take notes in the meeting, and if he listened to anyone, it was only to Hal and Ed. Will the hiring team value her opinion after the interview? Will the firm try to pair like with like, women interviewing and mentoring other women, putting people of the same race or culture together? This can be a disservice in a few ways. It pigeonholes candidates and new hires. It limits their exposure to people who might be able to be strong advocates, especially when they are from a marginalized group. And it limits the firm's ability to fully benefit from diversity. That certainly happened with the third candidate, Mark. While the team wisely chose not to reject him because of his disability, they aren't setting him up for success. They've chosen an attorney to interview him who won't be able to be a strong advocate for him within the firm. Arthur doesn't even know the attorney's name and they seem to have an implicit bias that Mark isn't up for the environment, despite the fact that he has been successful both at school and at a clerkship. Whenever there's a question about whether or not candidates or attorneys are up to the challenge, the best approach is to describe the situation and let people determine their capacity and ability for themselves. This comes up a lot with travel, especially with attorneys who are mothers. A decision is often made to not assign someone who's a mother to work that requires travel, based on the assumption that it will be too much for her. But that's not necessarily a correct assumption at all. Instead, just describe the requirements and ask. Whenever there are work requirements that might rule someone out, it's also important to make sure that they actually are requirements. For example, if the potential issue is travel, is the travel really necessary for the work, or is it just the way that it has always been done? The fourth candidate, Sean, got an interview simply because someone on the committee had already met and liked him. That would be fine, except that it seemed to be based entirely on appearance. Ed, the attorney who had met Sean, didn't speak about the candidate's background, intelligence, or anything relevant to the job. Just that he looked the part. The discussion over the fifth candidate, Alexis, showed how organizations can be biased when it comes to experience as well. Some experience and internships, such as clerking, are seen as valuable and prestigious, while other experience and internships, such as working at a nonprofit legal services provider, may be seen by big firms as less prestigious and desirable, even though they give participants great work experience and hands-on learning. These biases against certain experience often align with other biases. Opportunities that frequently go to white men may be perceived to be more valuable than opportunities that more often go to women and diverse attorneys. Keep an open mind to what skills people may have gained from their experience, whether that experience is typically perceived as prestigious or not. In addition to being rated poorly by the review team due to her non-prestigious past experiences, Alexis seemed to have been ruled out simply because someone else from the same school didn't work out at the firm once. That happens more than you might think for people from underrepresented backgrounds. Often, diverse attorneys feel like they represent all people from their background, whereas people who have privilege are treated as individuals. Can you imagine saying, we had someone from Harvard once and he didn't work out, so let's think twice before hiring someone else from Harvard? Of course not. But replace Harvard with a lesser known school that has no graduates already working in the firm or in the orbit of the firm's partners, and somehow, that bias becomes acceptable. Additionally, people from privileged backgrounds are often allowed to fail, learn, and try again, whereas attorneys from more diverse backgrounds might only get one shot. If an attorney with a diverse background makes a mistake, they often won't be given a second chance, and knowing that they only have one shot actually puts them in an anxious state that ironically makes them more likely to make a mistake. 
After just one mistake, their place in the firm typically never feels secure. It's like they are always on probation, always under the microscope. This is another instance of confirmation bias. If you have a negative bias against someone, you'll ignore the evidence that conflicts with that view. Did you notice how Arthur pushed his decisions on the rest of the team? This was especially clear with the final candidate. That may even be the right choice. Jack seemed like a fine candidate. But it's definitely not the right process. It wasn't at all clear whether the rest of the team would have been comfortable speaking up if they disagreed with him. Meetings like this should involve a discussion where the team comes to a consensus, rather than offering an opportunity for one person to dominate and plow over others or bully to get their way. This is why it's considered a best practice to use an anonymous voting system in candidate review meetings. There are various software options available for real-time voting and meeting management, but you don't need technology to institute an anonymous voting process. Even writing yes or no on a piece of paper works. Sorry to interrupt, but the writers took this feedback and reworked the scene. I thought you'd want to see. Thanks everyone for being part of the hiring committee. We've received a lot of resumes and we need to go through them and decide who we want to invite to come in for an interview. We're continuing to reach out to find applicants at a range of different schools. and I'm excited about all the different people we have. <laughs> Looks like everyone has brought a device for voting. Thanks for that. Has everyone set up the polling software? Yeah. And do you all have the resumes we sent out? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. I've asked Tyler to join us to take notes and tally the votes on who we want to interview. But no one, not even Tyler, will see who votes for who. Tyler, thanks for joining us today. So let's get started by going through the applicants one by one, OK? The first candidate is uh, Kwame An Anagwu. Anagwu. Kwame Okongwu. OK, thanks. Uh, got it. Kwame Okongwu. And he has excellent grades and lots of activities. He really does. And you'll also notice this is a new school for us to interview from. Um, as far as I'm aware, we've never had a hire or even an interviewee from this school before. Yeah, I definitely don't remember interviewing from this school before. Though, Hamali, uh, you know best. And this guy does really look good. This is great. It'll help us towards our goal of increasing the number of different schools we recruit from. And I agree, this guy looks really good. Yeah, his grades and activities are definitely impressive. Oh, but I see that he has two periods after summer associate? Uh, okay, <laughs> good catch. Well, that's something to keep an eye on. It's just one small mistake, but I agree that we should keep an eye out for attention to detail as we learn more about Kwame. Other than that one typo, his resume looks really good to me, and I'm not seeing any other typos. He definitely seems worth interviewing. I agree. Ready to vote? OK, let's vote on whether or not to bring in Kwame Okongwu for an interview. Vote yes to bring him in, no to pass. All votes are in. We will be inviting Kwame back for an interview. Let's put him with Turner. That guy seems like he'd be a great fit for the new work he just signed. Got it. OK, then we're on to number two. Diana Samuels. Hey, Arthur, look. <laughs> she went to your law school. Ah. She did. Well, you never know. Sometimes that works out, but we know nothing's a sure thing. <laughs> yeah, but she does have a typo on her resume, too. Uh, the S and the U in Summer Associate are both capitalized. OK. What is it about sending us resumes with typos? Yeah, that's surprising. Not a deal breaker, but definitely something we need to keep an eye on as we learn more about her. Her grades and activities are solid. I agree. Definitely solid, but not really more than that. She kind of has a generic resume. Yeah, nothing really stands out about her. I agree. Given the quality of the resumes that we get, there's nothing outstanding about this one. Nothing, in my mind, that makes us want to interview her. OK, I'm with you guys. She's fine, but almost every resume we get is fine. She doesn't give us anything more. Ready to vote? OK, yes to bring her in, no to pass. All votes are in. 
we will be passing on Diana Samuels. Okay, moving on. Next up, Mark Thomas. Another good school, and we've made a lot of good hires from that school before. True, though everyone's different, and even the best schools have good and bad candidates. Let's see if we think Mark is one of the good ones. His grades look great. Yeah. Oh, he has a really prestigious clerkship. I'm impressed. This is a really good resume. Although I see that he's playing in a wheelchair basketball league that he has under summer activities. To me, that makes him even more impressive of a candidate. Think about how much determination he must have to accomplish all that he has, and he still has the energy to play in a wheelchair basketball league. This guy sounds like a great candidate. Should we put it to a vote? Okay, yes or no on interviewing Mark Thomas. All votes are in. We'll be asking him in for an interview. And let's move on to our next candidate, Sean Fitzgerald. Sean Fitzgerald, the guy who clerked for Judge Brown? Yep, yeah, that's him. You know him? Not well, but I met him at a fundraising dinner a couple of months ago, and we talked for a while. Nice guy. Looks really well put together. Very polished. Huh. Okay, but how about anything of substance? What did you guys talk about? You know, really, I don't remember much. It was small talk, and he didn't really say anything that was memorable. The suit was probably really the most impressive thing about him. <laughs> yeah, his resume is just okay. Ready for a vote? We'll be passing on Sean Fitzgerald. Okay, next up for review is Alexis Lopez. Oh, good grades. She has a publication. And her publication is about legal services clients. She could bring a new perspective to us, which we need. That makes sense these days more than ever. We need to keep expanding our perspectives, and that can lead to new business. Yeah, I agree. I really like her resume. Okay, let's vote. The yeses have it. We'll be inviting her in for an interview. Ah. Let's move on to our final candidate for today, Jack Lewis. Well, good school, good grades. Oh, and he clerked for Judge Williams. She's great. She spends a lot of time with her clerks. They come out with really good experience. Anyone else want to weigh in? Okay, then let's vote. All votes are in. We'll be inviting Jack Lewis in for an interview. Um, and that does it. That's everyone. I think we're done here. Great work, team. So now we're going to see a handful of scenes in which there's an instance of bias and also talk and learn about how to interrupt bias and how people who are taking this course can be better at doing so. So this uh, next clip has several scenes followed by some expert comments and uh, once again a chance to see it uh, done a little bit better after that. So let's take a look. I sent over some scenes and the writers would love your help. These are four short scenes, vignettes really, that show snippets of a day in the life of some of the characters in the firm. The writers are trying something new, where some of the characters break the fourth wall and the audience gets to see what they're thinking. As you watch these scenes, keep an eye out for instances of bias and pay attention to whether or not you see any instances where these biases are interrupted. So we need a senior associate to head up the group of associates on the litigation prep. We need someone who's familiar with the matter and someone who can handle a lot of moving parts and someone who can keep the team motivated while under really tight deadlines. How about Logan Gage? He's been all this work from the start and he knows it inside and out. Plus, he worked on logistics when he was deployed in the military and he was in charge of a team there as well. And I know the associates and partners respect him. Yeah, I, I like Logan. I just don't think he's right for this. How about Caitlin Roberts instead? She handles pressure really well, and she has a really positive style when working with teams. Okay, 
I don't think she has quite the experience that Logan does, but since you'll be the one overseeing the work, I'm fine with Caitlin. Logan's been great, but he makes me nervous. I have no idea what he saw when he was deployed, but I hear those stories about PTSD and vets having a hard time adjusting. This is a really high pressure role and I just don't wanna push him too hard. Plus, I need to make sure that the team can stay engaged and motivated. They need an upbeat management style, not someone who might overdo the hardcore military discipline. Thank you for your service. That's what people say to my face when they learn I'm a vet. But behind my back, it's a different story. They make all kinds of assumptions about me, about my character, and my style, that I'm rigid and autocratic, that all I could do is march and follow orders, that I'm unemotional, or that I'm always about to break down. They have this stereotype about what a veteran is, but we're all different just like everybody else. I don't know how to show them. I get along with all my colleagues. I've been in much more stressful situations than here at the firm, and I've never once broken down under the pressure. I'd say I'm better at handling pressure than anyone here. I'm not sure what else I can do to convince people that they're not really seeing me as I am. So, we're going to have to do a lot of due diligence with the client getting them ready for this acquisition, so we'll have to go through the financials with a fine-tooth comb. Whew, a lot of math. Allie, why don't you take the lead on that while Mary and Pete talk to the executive team? Um, okay. I think Allie is good with numbers. At least I'm pretty sure she is. Oh, I get it. The Asian is good at math, so I'll be stuck in the office all day and night going through the finances while the rest of the team is getting FaceTime with the client and the partner. <laughs> well, the joke's on them. Math was always my worst subject. Hey. I heard you went out to dinner with Turner and some other partners after work yesterday. How did you manage that? Turner and my uncle were fraternity brothers back in the day, so my uncle put me on his radar. It was great to get to know some of the partners outside of the office, and Turner asked me if I wanted a spot on the defense for that politician we just agreed to represent. Man, you are so lucky. I wish I had someone with connections in my family. Well, lucky for you, you're connected to me. He asked me for another associate and I gave him your name, so you're in. It's a super social team. Drinks and dinners on Wednesdays, golf on Saturdays. Work hard, play hard. You'll love it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> hey, Alec, what have you been working on these days? Oh, I guess I probably shouldn't have brought that up in front of Alec. He's a good guy, but the partners and the clients are old school. I don't care what Alec does in his personal life, but I know the clients would be uncomfortable with someone who is gay. and. I'm not going to be the one who brings that onto the team. I wonder if I shouldn't be out at work. I mean, no one says anything specifically about my being gay, but I feel like they keep me at arm's length, like I'll never be one of them. And it's so unfair that because I'm not one of the guys, I never get any of the good new assignments. Okay, the next candidate for partner is Sandra Marshall. She's been with us for 11 years. She did such great work on the Porter acquisition that they hired us to advise them on revamping the corporate governance structure as well. And she's in the top 5% of billable hours with one of our top realization rates as well. She's making lots of money for us. And that's even taking into account that she got married and took a honeymoon. We didn't see any overall drop off in her billing. I don't know. She's doing great where she is, but I question her long-term dedication to the firm. Let's give it another year and revisit then. Okay, let's table her and revisit this next year. Look, 
Sandra's great. There's no denying that. But there's been a pattern of women her age getting married, getting pregnant, and then not coming back, which takes a spot from someone else, and it makes us look really bad. I'm not saying that she'll never make partner. It's still early. The average is 12 years before making partner. She's only been here 11. I'm just saying the smart move is to wait and see. I didn't make partner. Are you kidding me? I have been working like crazy. I built practically more than anyone else at my level. I turned my life over for this firm. Did they say why? It's because I got married this year, isn't it? I delegated all my planning, and then I took a really short honeymoon, which I postponed to coincide with the downtime on the matter that I was working on. But three years ago, one woman got married and pregnant shortly after making partner. One woman, one. And now we're all paying for it. Tell me, did Jake make partner? Because he got married this year too. Did he? He did, of course. That is so unfair. How else am I supposed to show my dedication to this place? Well, there were certainly some instances of bias, no doubt about that. But did you see any instances of bias being interrupted? Keep in mind that there are multiple ways to interrupt bias. You can intervene when you see it directed at someone else, or you can say or do something when it is directed at you. You can put systems in place to prevent bias, or at least to stop the effects of bias, and to create a culture where differences are welcomed. And you can be aware of your own biases and not act on them. Next, you'll get the chance to weigh in on what you did or didn't see. Once you've started thinking about biases, you're likely to start seeing more and more bias around you. Ironically, this phenomenon is a bias itself, observation bias. So you probably noticed biases in all four of the previous scenes. Logan, the veteran, was denied an opportunity because of assumptions that he might be suffering from PTSD and that he might have an inappropriate management style. Ali was given a role that she didn't seem to want and that she might not be the best fit for based on the stereotype that Asians are good at math. Both Todd and Bill got work because of their relationships with and similarities to the partner making the decisions and to each other, denying Alec and many others these opportunities because they aren't perceived to be insiders. And Sandra didn't make partner because it's perceived that she will be like a previous partner who got pregnant after becoming partner. Of course, all of these biases hurt the people who are the targets of the biases, but they also hurt the organization. People aren't being placed in the roles that are best for them, there's no strategy for helping people develop, and the firm is creating a culture where people aren't feeling appreciated. If this keeps up, they're going to see more and more people leaving to go where they are treated fairly and feel appreciated. Any one of these biases could have been addressed, either on the spot or with follow-up, or prevented altogether. But they weren't. No one did anything to interrupt these biases. Let's look at some ways that these biases could have been interrupted. When you see an instance of bias, you have a choice. Do you want to be a bystander, someone who lets the bias go unchecked, maybe hoping that someone else stands up or maybe just letting the bias stand? Or do you want to be an upstander, someone who challenges the bias and is an ally, who stands up for the person to whom the bias is targeted, especially when that person is unable to stand up for themselves or is still processing the event. This may seem like an easy choice. Who doesn't want to do the right thing? And yet, many people remain bystanders. We saw that happen in the previous scenes. Being an upstander in a law office can be challenging because of fear of retaliation, such as a loss of career advancement opportunities. So how can you be an upstander? While there's no single way to deal with instances of bias, we do have some guidelines that can help. Start by reflecting on what is happening and decide whether or not you want to interrupt. You may or may not choose to be an upstander in the moment. The circumstances and people involved may make it difficult or risky to intervene on the spot. As you decide what to do, consider whether or not you would be helping or hurting the situation. 
Your focus should initially be on the person who was hurt rather than on the person who said the hurtful thing. How do you think it feels for someone to have bias directed at them? What impact do you think it might have on their career? Think about what you can do to help them. How can you be an ally in this situation? As an upstander or an ally, you may need to go outside of your comfort zone. Consider your relationship to the person exhibiting the bias and other potential career risks. Balance the reasonable concern you may have for preserving your relationships, status, or career with the very real danger of leaving someone's biased comment out there without correction and with the hurt that has been delivered to your colleague or coworker. After you make these considerations, decide if and how you want to act. If you determine you want to intervene in the moment, a good place to start is by asking a question or making a statement to get the person exhibiting the bias to think about their behavior. Ask something like, please tell me what you mean when you say something like that, or pardon me, but I don't agree with what you said. The goal is to call upon that person to be mindful and reflective, as well as to stop the bias in that moment. It should not be about public humiliation, which is more likely to turn off someone you want to listen rather than encourage them to engage. After the incident, follow up with the person who was targeted. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge and validate their feelings that what happened is not okay and offer help as an ally. You may want to report the incident to human resources or another group. Make sure the person who was targeted is in agreement with this before you do it. While you may have good intentions, a report may have unintended consequences. Ask, do you want me to report this? Or offer to go together. But don't eliminate the rights and autonomy of the recipient of the bias by deciding on your own to report the incident. You may also want to talk to influential members of the firm who you trust and think will be receptive. You could let them know what is happening and ask for their help with trying to put systems in place that would change the firm's culture with the goal of trying to prevent these things from happening in the future. I do want to offer a word of caution. However you decide to intervene, be careful not to come off as the savior. You aren't rescuing a helpless victim and you shouldn't be motivated by the desire to be the hero. Don't draw attention to yourself and don't make things worse for the person who is targeted. Give that person a chance to stand up for themselves first and look to them for guidance as to whether or not to continue. Sometimes you may be the object of biases yourself. We explored this a bit earlier when we discussed microaggressions. First, let me take a moment to say that I'm sorry that this happens. If you do decide to act, many of the same strategies that you can use to interrupt bias as an upstander for others can also work if the bias is directed toward you. Start by taking a moment to reflect on how you feel about what happened. Then, you can decide if you want to take action, either by interrupting the bias in the moment or by following up later. When you make that decision, consider your own well-being, time concerns, and energy, as well as your relationship to the person expressing bias, the situation, career concerns, and honestly, how you are feeling at that point. If you choose to act, you may want to start with a question, such as, why do you say that? Questions like that work for a few reasons. When they are asked in the moment, they stop the conversation and shift the focus from you. They redirect the person expressing bias to consciously think about what they have said or done. And they let you confront the bias without being confrontational. No one will accuse you of being combative. All you did was ask a question. Next, if and only if you want to, you can share how the action or statement made you feel. You don't have to do this. You don't owe it to anyone but it could be a teaching opportunity and could go a long way toward building empathy in the other person. For example, saying something like, when you ask me to leave the meeting to make copies, it makes me feel like I'm not a valued member of the team. This makes people aware of the bias as well as its impact. Allow the person the opportunity to respond and share their perspective. Be aware that the person may say, I didn't mean it that way, but sometimes just making people aware of the bias in their own behaviors is enough and other times, the conversation may lead to meaningful understanding. A lot of people find it helpful to draw on an ally. You can make a trusted colleague aware of what is happening, how it makes you feel, and ask for help. Then, that person might be able to help intervene after the fact using the strategies we discussed. Keep in mind that you don't have to address an incident of bias against you if it seems risky or if you don't want to. 
It isn't your job to educate people just because you may be a member of a group that is discriminated against. You could go to a trusted confidant to help you figure out what, if anything, to do and to give them information that they can then use to make or influence changes in the systems and culture of the organization. Finally, whether you confront the situation in the moment or not, you may want to report the incident to human resources, to another department that deals with such matters, or to someone higher up in your organization. Again, this is your call. There is no single right way to address bias, whether it is happening to you or whether you see it directed at someone else. But we hope that the strategies we shared help empower you to take action when you want and be an upstander instead of a bystander. It's the job of the leadership to establish systems and a culture to make sure these biases aren't playing out in the workplace. If you are in a position to do this, there are a number of systems that you might suggest that your law office or organization consider. First is hiring systems. Start by making sure you have a diverse team making the decisions and then make sure that you have diverse candidates in the pipeline. Seek out new sources of diverse candidates. Make the process as objective as possible. Have resumes scrubbed for identifying information so that bias doesn't come into play. Use objective criteria, but also look at candidates in context. For example, a candidate who was born in poverty and worked her way through a mid-tier law school may be more impressive than a candidate from an Ivy League school. If decision makers do fall back into the pattern of hiring the same kinds of people over and over again, remind decision makers of examples of successful people in the organization who don't fit the traditional mold. Next, you'll want to create fair work assignment and monitoring systems. Make sure these systems consider the objective needs of each matter rather than a partner's preferences or the firm's traditions. Give all attorneys a fair chance at key assignments as well as at meaningful roles on those assignments. Sometimes a firm will claim their teams are diverse and on the surface they are, but really the firm is following old models when it comes to who gets the good roles. Rotate associates through working with different partners when possible, in order to avoid key partners building up stables of their favorite associates, at least until everyone has been given a fair chance. And speaking of fair chances, give all attorneys the chance to fail, learn, and try again. Don't use client preferences as an excuse for not having diverse teams or for selecting certain types of people for certain clients. Clients are often not as concerned with their attorney's pedigree as many firms are, and many clients have a mandate for diverse teams. Third, create fair review and promotion systems. As with hiring, make sure you have a diverse team making decisions. Consider opportunity as well as performance, and ensure pay equity. There are existing software solutions out there that can help put these systems into place. For example, software is available that scrubs identifying data from resumes, helps make work assignments based on fair criteria, and facilitates objective reviews. There are a number of other things to do to make your firm diverse and inclusive. One key thing to do is make diversity a measurable criterion when it comes to evaluation. Evaluate partners on their work creating diverse teams, or if you are in a law department, tie compensation to diversity. But you can't just make diversity measurable and then expect everyone to magically be able to achieve it. The organization should provide educational opportunities for people at all levels, but especially at the leadership level. All attorneys should be required to take an implicit bias course mm -hmm. so they can examine their own biases and then work on interrupting them. Additionally, all supervising attorneys should be trained on how to deliver effective, unbiased feedback to the attorneys they review. And feedback shouldn't be a one-way street. The review process should include 360-degree reviews so that attorneys get feedback from their supervising attorneys, peers, and direct reports. The culture should value honesty and diversity to make sure that feedback can be given freely without fear of repercussion. Exit interviews should be conducted for every departing employee to determine if that employee faced any issues with bias, regardless of whether or not that was the direct reason for their departure. Another key thing to do is to put sponsorship programs, not just mentoring programs, in place. There is a difference. Mentors provide information, wisdom, advice, and insight. They show someone the ropes and give the attorneys they are mentoring the benefit of their experience. Mentors are great, and many organizations have terrific programs to match mentors and mentees. But that's not enough. 
Attorneys from underrepresented groups should have powerful sponsors as well. Sponsors are advocates. They should be someone senior in the organization who is well respected and willing to speak up for their protégés. Their goal isn't to provide advice, it is to make sure the attorney they sponsor has a successful career, and they should be willing to go to bat for the attorneys they sponsor to make sure this happens. Don't assign sponsors based on superficial similarities such as having gone to the same school or being a member of the same group. Ideally, sponsors don't look like the attorney they are sponsoring. Informal sponsorship relationships often happen naturally for white male associates, but structures need to be in place for attorneys from underrepresented groups to make sure they have someone looking out for them. All systems should be transparent and decisions should be made explicit. Decision makers should have to explain why they're making the decisions they make. The simple act of explaining your reasoning eliminates a lot of bias. What gets measured gets managed. As with any system, it's critical to monitor, gather, and review data and regularly audit the results. Are the majority of hires still white men? Are the white male attorneys still getting the best assignments repeatedly? Are most women and diverse attorneys leaving before they can be promoted or are they being passed over for promotions? Look for any remaining patterns of exclusion and imbalance and make adjustments to the systems accordingly. There are software packages available to help examine and manage metrics and accountability. The best way, really the only way, to truly address systematic bias is with top-down leadership commitment and follow-through using processes, monitoring, and sustaining procedures. If you are in a position to help put these in place, it's crucial that you do so. As we noted earlier, it helps to be aware of what your own biases are. Then you can keep an eye out for them and put countermeasures in place. For example, if you are biased against older people, the next time you encounter someone older, really pay attention to your reactions. Are you reacting to that person, to what they are saying and what they are doing, or are you reacting to your biases? But you'll never know the full list of things you might be biased for or against, so be prepared for biases to pop up at any point. You may wonder how you can interrupt something that you aren't even aware of. Good question. The trick is to build pauses and self-checks into your routines. Try to make your thought processes explicit. Slow down your decision making. Ask yourself why you want to hire, promote, or assign work to someone. Or even better, work with someone else, ideally someone who is different from you. And do this process together. Look at who you are spending time with. Who do you have lunch with? Who do you socialize with outside of work? Who do you text or email? Who do you go to for advice? From time to time, go back to look for patterns. Do you always choose the same types of people? Do you always exclude the same types of people? You may even want to evaluate yourself in a more formal way. Make a list of key questions about yourself, such as the ones I just mentioned, write down your answers, and track them over time. Then think about how these patterns affect your decisions and whether you want to change your patterns. This type of self-inventory and self-auditing process makes you more aware of your potential biases and can even help you address some of them. Another way to help interrupt your own biases is to practice inclusion. Take a different path to your office so you see different people along the way. Greet the people you see. Reach out to include people outside of your immediate circle. And think before you speak. Practice mindfulness. Be more thoughtful about what you say and what you do. You'll also need to understand what your own privileges are. 
What advantages do you have because of the biases people have in your favor? When you're in a situation when your privilege may be giving you an advantage, for example, if you came from a very affluent background, consider whether there is someone else who is on the opposite side of that situation. Can you use your privilege in that moment to help even the playing field? Show that you are open to feedback, and then be prepared if other people comment on your biases. They may raise something you did or said. This can be really uncomfortable, and your initial response may be to explain or defend your intent. Don't. Your intent doesn't really matter. Your impact does. Listen to the feedback and really consider it. Then apologize. You certainly can explain that you didn't mean to make that person feel that way, but take responsibility for what you said or what you did, and then commit to making a change. Your biases aren't set in stone, and there are ways to change them instead of just interrupting them. Seek out positive and meaningful relationships with people who are different from you. Have lunch with people in different groups. See if there are events you can attend to learn more about different kinds of people, about their culture, and about the challenges they face. Appreciate the differences and look for similarities. As you start seeing people from other groups as individuals instead of as members of a group, your biases will start to break down. Mind shifts follow actions. Start the desired behavior and your biases will start to change accordingly. The writers have done some rewrites to the day in a life scenes. So now the biases are being interrupted. Let's see what they came up with. So we need a senior associate to head up the group of associates on the litigation prep. We need someone who's familiar with the matter and someone who can handle a lot of moving parts and someone who can keep the team motivated while under really tight deadlines. How about Logan Gage? He's been on this work from the start, so he knows it inside and out. Plus, he did logistics work when he was deployed in the military and he was in charge of a team there as well. And I know the associates and partners respect him. I like Logan. Uh, I just don't think he's right for this. How about Caitlin Roberts instead? She works really well under pressure and is really positive when working with teams. Caitlin's great, but she doesn't have the experience on this matter and the relationship with the team that Logan has. What are your concerns about him? Uh, I just I don't want to put too much pressure on him. There's a lot going on with this matter. Plus, I worry about his management style. What do you mean? He seems to handle pressure pretty well and he gets along great with the team. Well, his military history. I just read those stories about PTSD and vets having a hard time adjusting. I haven't seen any signs of that. He seems pretty even-tempered. We can keep an eye out, but like I said, I haven't seen anything to indicate any problem. He seems to do very well under pressure. What is your concern about his management style? Well, the military is very chain of command and following orders. And it's just not our style. That's true, but from everything that I've seen, that's not Logan's style either. I've never seen him act like that. And I think it's fair to bring up style and expectations, but we shouldn't deny him the chance for something that isn't based on our experience with him. Okay, that's fair. Let's give him a shot. So, we are going to have to do a lot of due diligence getting the client ready for the acquisition and we are going to need to go through the financials with a fine-tooth comb. It's a lot of math. So, Ali, why don't you take the lead on that while Mary and Pete talk to the executive team? I'm happy to help however you think is best, but I'm not sure that's the best role for me. I don't have a strong background in math and I'd really love to work on my interviewing skills. I got a taste of that on my last assignment and I'd love to do more. Oh, okay. All right. Well, is there anyone else who would be interested in doing the financials? I actually would. I was an accounting minor in undergrad and that's the aspect of M&A I find the most interesting. Great. Okay, Mary, you take the financials and Allie, you do the interviews with me. So, you may have heard that we're working on a defense for that politician we just agreed to represent. The work assignment system suggested the two of you. 
looks like not only are you both available, but you bring great skills and experience to this matter. And you'll have an opportunity to develop some new skills as well. It's going to be busy and very, very high profile. But I heard you're up for the challenge. I'm very excited about working with you both. Okay, next candidate for partner is Sandra Marshall. She's been with us for 11 years. She did such great work for us on the Porter acquisition that they hired us to advise them on revamping their corporate governance structure as well. And she's in the top 5% of billable hours with one of our top realization rates as well. She's making lots of money for us. And that's even taking into account that she got married and took a honeymoon. We didn't see any overall drop off in her billing. She's really good, but I do have a concern. I'm kind of worried that she'll do what Jessica did and have a baby and leave us right away. But you're right. She's great and has shown us nothing but dedication. She definitely has her own partner. So I guess that's a risk worth taking. I vote yes. I think those scenes are so much better now. I definitely agree. And the outcomes aren't just better for those at whom the biases were aimed, but the organization is better off as well. Let's break down what happened. In the first scene, we saw Amir jump in and interrupt the bias. It wasn't confrontational. He simply followed up with questions about why Savannah didn't want to put Logan in that role. One reason that Amir's approach worked was because he and Savannah seemed to be peers with a good working relationship. But if there was a power imbalance between the two, and if Savannah wasn't receptive to being questioned, it might not have been smart for Amir to interrupt bias in this way. It's always important to be aware of the situation, the other people, and your relationship to them before you act. If it doesn't seem reasonable to intervene in the moment, keep in mind that there are other ways to interrupt bias. In the second scene, Allie, the person who was targeted, was able to self-advocate. Again, no confrontation was needed. She raised her concerns and addressed the bias indirectly by pointing out that math is not her strong suit while positively expressing her interest in other skills. But again, if the situation were different, this may have been risky for her. It is good to know how to intervene on your own behalf in the moment, but you also need to have a good sense of when to do it. If you aren't in a culture of listening and inclusion, it may be better not to try to interrupt bias when it occurs. In the third scene, when we saw which associates Turner had chosen, we got to see how systems, in this case a work assignment system, can prevent bias being triggered at all. And in the fourth scene, we saw an example of Amir identifying his own bias. He was able to recognize that he was making assumptions that Sandra would have a baby and leave. And once he admitted this bias, he could consciously interrupt it himself. While these are all good examples of interrupting bias, it's important to keep in mind that there isn't one right or even best way to handle these situations. These scenes could have been handled in many different ways, and the right systems could have prevented most, if not all of them. When you see bias at play, consider the situation when deciding whether and how to intervene. If you can't intervene in the moment, think about whether or not you can follow up with a trusted person in your network or whether your organization has a process to report bias with the goal of preventing it in the future. So as we near the uh, end of the program, uh, Michelle Silverthorne, our DEI expert, comes back to kind of debrief, go over some of the key points. And as you'll see, she refers to some of the scenes that um, you've seen throughout the course, that the learners have seen throughout the course, and then brings up a couple of other activities, So one of which is um, a series of attorneys and the way that they are doing things in their firm, the roles that they're playing when we get to evaluate how well we think that they're doing. So we're going to take a look at a little bit of Michelle and then a brief activity. So as we near the uh, end of the program, uh, Michelle Silverthorne, our DEI expert, comes back to kind of debrief, go over some of the key points, and as you'll see, she refers to some of the scenes that um, you've seen throughout the course, that the learners have seen throughout the course, and then brings up a couple of other activities, so one of which is um, a series of attorneys and the way that they are doing things in their firm, the roles that they're playing when we get to evaluate how well we think that they're doing. So we're going to take a look at a little bit of Michelle and then a brief activity. We saw many examples of bias throughout the program. Are any of these experiences similar to what you've experienced? I know some were for me. 
If not, were you able to step into the shoes of those who were experiencing bias to better understand their experiences? Let's take a look back at a segment from the hiring committee scene. Does everyone have the resumes we sent out? Uh, Jill, could you take notes on our decisions as we go? Uh, sure. How do you think it feels for Jill to be a partner in a law firm and still be the one asked to take notes? Remember Casey's exit interview? Let's take a look. I've thought about this for a while, and I've decided that it's time for me to move on and leave the firm. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, Casey. Uh, you're a valuable member of the team, and I, for one, hate to lose you. Can I ask why you're leaving, and uh, is, there, is there anything we can do to change your mind? Thank you, but I've made my decision. I just don't think the firm is a good fit for me. How do you think it felt for Casey to have been left behind because he was deaf? He ended up saying only that the firm wasn't the right fit for him, but it was clear why that really was. And Pete confirmed this when they met to discuss why so many people were leaving. He's been working on the Doe Light matter and uh, their VP doesn't like Casey's interpreter joining us. The VP says it slows down the meetings. So Casey gets left behind to do the back end work, which, I mean, come on, is so disrespectful. But Casey's bigger complaint is that he hasn't really gotten to build relationships with the client and build those client facing skills. And while Jill felt marginalized in her scene with Arthur and the others, she then put Allie in a very awkward position when discussing due diligence work for an acquisition. So. We're going to have to do a lot of due diligence with the client getting them ready for this acquisition, so we'll have to go through the financials with a fine-tooth comb. Whew. A lot of math. Allie, why don't you take the lead on that while Mary and Pete talk to the executive team? Um, okay. Imagine what it must have felt like for Allie to be asked to do difficult math just because she's Asian. And Kwame Okongwu wasn't aware of Arthur making fun of his name during the hiring committee meeting and initially passing over him for an interview. But I imagine there are plenty of times that this kind of thing might have happened in Kwame's presence as well. And that's the thing about microaggressions. They keep happening. They amplify one and another and another and another. It's what I call the death by a thousand cuts. So how do you address this? Start with your own biases and focus on what work you can do yourself. You'll also want to focus on your sphere of influence, which can help you make larger institutional changes. Don't pass the buck to someone else to do the work. The work starts with you. It isn't enough to make changes in your own behavior. You need to look at your own sphere of influence if you want to change the system. Next, you'll hear three approaches for how lawyers in different situations can apply what they've learned to make changes within their spheres of influence. For each approach, you'll be asked to evaluate whether or not you think the approach is a good one. Then you'll hear what I think. First, let's hear from Ava, a solo practitioner. I always thought of myself as fair, but I now realize that I have biases too. I'll definitely work to be more aware of them and to interrupt them when I can. And I love the idea of branching out to explore other cultures. There's a black theater company downtown. And on Tuesday nights, they have a discussion with wine and cheese after the show. So maybe I could even meet some new people. But I'm a solo practitioner. I don't really have any spheres of influence. So I'll just work twice as hard on myself. Well, it's great that Ava is going to apply what she's learned to her own practice, but she's selling herself short to think that she doesn't have a sphere of influence. Is she a member of a bar association? Does she socialize with other lawyers? Does she ever outsource work? Those are all ways she can work to make change. So do I think Ava's approach was a good one? Well, somewhat. She's got specific ideas for what she can do, but she is missing the opportunity to work for greater change. So after this, there are a couple more similar activities, and then Michelle wraps up the course, and that's the end of the uh, diversity and inclusion for attorneys course. Uh, one more thing we did want to show uh, was a sample um, 
little branching uh, mini simulation, which is part of a different course. So I'm going to go ahead and show that next. This is from another course, also for PLI, um, about selling uh, selling work uh, to other attorneys in uh, client firms. So this is a little mini branching simulation, and you get to see a little bit of that. This is a segment from a course that's aimed at an audience of attorneys to help them uh, get better at selling business to both new and existing clients. And the course has a number of different modules with different uh, types of experiences. This is a simulation uh, module, and we're gonna take a look at a simulation scenario where you'll see um, that you're playing the role of an attorney who is about to have a lunch meeting with an existing client and has the opportunity to try to take this meeting and use it to try to get uh, more business. So let's take a look at what happens here. So you're at lunch with Sylvia Sloan. She's your primary contact at MZQ Data Solutions, which is a mid-sized company specializing in cloud-based data storage. Your firm has a strong employment law practice and has recently expanded its patent division. And you also have a strong pre-existing relationship with MZQ. And that's gone very, very well. Uh, Sylvia has been your contact. Um, and now we get a little bit more background information about this conversation to this point. You and Sylvia have gone over the work that your firm has been doing, uh, but nothing more. So now what do I say? So it's just a few minutes before this meeting ends and we have a few choices. Uh, one is, did I tell you how much our patent group has expanded? I think we're the best in the business in patent law now. So we're gonna focus on patent law. Next is asking uh, about the trends in the legal department. Uh, and then if she's asking for a new firm to handle her patent work. So feels a little bit too open-ended to ask about trends at the end of the conversation. I, directly asking for a new firm to handle the patent work seems maybe too much. I'm gonna say, did I tell you how much our patent uh, group has expanded? I think we're the best in the business in patent law now. That's great, I'm glad you're expanding. All right, so now I have a few things I can say. So she's moderately happy about that, I suppose. Um, expanding is an understatement. Let's tell her more about our wonderful expansion in the patent area. Uh, I could ask her if she has any patent work coming up uh, or just ask her some more general questions. So I'm gonna say um, that expanding is an understatement. We just picked up two great partners uh, and really she should hire us. I mean, I think that we are the right people for any patent work that she has. I'm sure you have a good team. I'll keep you in mind. All right, so she said she'll keep us in mind. It wasn't maybe the most enthusiastic response um, that I can ever imagine, but I'll just go ahead and thank her and say, you know what, I, I appreciate it. Uh, you won't be disappointed, and I think she'll be happy with us. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I think it's probably time to head back to the office now. I have tons of work to do. All right, so she's going to wrap up the conversation and uh, go back to the office. And now we're going to get a chance to see what Sylvia thought of the conversation that we just had. Your focus on patent work actually prevented the possibility of discussing our real needs at MZQ. We've had some layoffs here lately and need to outsource more work to outside firms, but that didn't even come up in our conversation. Plus, I felt a little bit turned off by the bragging tone. We have a good history with you and your firm, but if you were looking for more work, you missed an opportunity with me during this conversation. All right, so it's interesting we get feedback here, not from a coaching component, but from a character in the simulation, the person that I spoke to as the user uh, myself. And so I get direct feedback in a way that you wouldn't really be able to get honestly in real life, and so you get a level of candor here, which is really, really nice. And she, she gives it to you straight. She tells you, you know, what kind of worked and what didn't work, and it was really pretty much a, a conversation that, that didn't work. I you know, had really not taken the right approach here by going directly to patent work and kind of bragging about it and, and that kind of thing. So it didn't really go all that well. Uh, but what I have an opportunity to do next, and as many times as I would like, is try the scenario again. So let's take a look at the same scenario, and this time I'm gonna try some different things and see if I can maybe do uh, a little bit better than I did the first time through. So let me take this scenario again and go through the conversation another time, see if maybe I can uh, do a little bit better and be a little bit more convincing to uh, my old contact, Sylvia, and see if I can uh, help get some new work for the firm. So we're back at the beginning of the lunch meeting. 
and I have the same three choices I had at the beginning uh, last time, which is, did I tell you how much our patent group has expanded? I think we're the best in the business. Uh, asking open-ended questions about the trends in our legal department uh, or suggesting uh, that maybe she might be looking for a new firm to handle her patent work. I'm going to go ahead in this case do the same thing I did last time. And, you know, our patent group has expanded. That's a really big thing. I do think she still needs to, to know this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say that again. Did I tell you how much our patent group has expanded? I think we're the best in the business. That's great. I'm glad you're expanding. All right. So I kind of get that, you know, not overly enthusiastic response, but I've, I've made my point. But last time, you know, I made such a big deal about the great partners that we had and, and she didn't really like the bragging tone or, or sort of my level of uh, aggressiveness, I think, on that. Um, so this time I'm going to go in a different direction and ask an open-ended question. I'm going to choose the third option. Uh, it says we're excited about this and I'm going to ask her what's going on in her world over at MZQ and see if I can get some additional information and not push her too much toward patent work anymore. We have a lot going on, actually. We scaled back our in-house staff recently, so we'll be sending more work to outside firms. I know we already have some litigation work that we're going to have to outsource. All right, so that's pretty good. I got somewhere on that. Um, well, what can I do from here? Well, it, good to know. I do hope she keeps this in mind. Um, I could thank her for telling me. Um, or maybe I should actually be a little more ambitious here and see if there's someone who I could speak to. So I'm going to choose the third one and say, that's really good to know. Can you put me in touch with the lead at MCQ on that work? Sure, that's Melinda Chu. I think you met her once. Just call her and she'll give you all the details. Okay, I think it's probably time to head back to the office now. I have tons of work to do. Okay, well that was uh, much better, I think, than the first time through. Uh, let me go ahead and see how Sylvia thought it went. I certainly thought it went better, and the feedback I'm getting just from the, the lunch meeting, I got a lot more information, but uh, let's, let's see what Sylvia thought of this. I thought you were a little overly excited about your expansion in the patent law area, especially because you brought that up without having any idea if we needed patent work. But you then recovered and asked me a good question, which made me think about our layoffs and some possible new work for your firm. And then you asked me specifically who to talk to about the litigation work. That's not something I would have thought to suggest if you hadn't asked. So now, if you follow up with Melinda, you're definitely in the running for the litigation work. I think you put your firm in a good position. So as it turned out, this was a much better uh, plan. I took a much better approach, um, kind of recovered from maybe a slightly aggressive beginning and, and did much better. And so uh, that was a, a chance for me to do exactly the same scenario and have the same conversation, but start over and get the, you know, get to see if I can improve in a safe environment. And that's one of the really nice advantages of this model is that you can, you can try some things again and see if you can get uh, different outcomes. And we also saw there that based on the choices that I made early on, the next set of questions were going to be different. Her reaction might be different. And the follow-up questions that I would have would be appropriate for the context, um, whether they're questions or whether they're actions that I should take. So this is a little mini scenario um, simulation approach that worked very nicely for this audience. And um, in practice, people had a lot of fun with it. They uh, would tend to, and the observations that, that we were able to make, um, informally, we saw a lot of people who would go through it uh, a number of times because they really wanted to, to have a really good conversation. They kind of felt the challenge element uh, there a little bit, even without any specific score, but just wanted to get through this in a way that uh, made Sylvia give them some good feedback. And so it was interesting to watch an audience of attorneys uh, usually you know, try to value their time so much that they don't want to spend an extra moment that they don't have to if they're not billing for it, uh, go through and go through this uh, three, four or five times until they had a conversation that uh, Sylvia on screen really felt was, uh, was good enough. So that was fun to see. So this is a method that we, we really like and we're able to employ in a lot of different ways. And this is an example of uh, a, a scenario that adapts to you, the discussion and the, the choices adapt to you um, based on the decisions that you make. Uh, throughout the conversation and that lets you try it over and over uh, to improve and see if you can do better. So that wraps up this uh, demo session. We've seen a number of portions of the diversity and inclusion course and some ways that we've used actor scenes and some different activity types and also the branching simulation model, which we often employ uh, sometimes in more complex ways as well and really, really like. 
And we've shown that example from the uh, sales situation uh, for attorneys as well. So that should wrap this up and we hope you enjoyed uh, the demos. And of course, please get in touch with any questions. And we look forward to talking with you further.